grace and peace of God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Perhaps most of you know that we have a confirmation class uh, of three and Connor is in that and Grace is in that and Shauna is in that and I said make sure that when we start you get out your notebook and also get out uh, the bulletin or the handout and so I would encourage all here to open up the handout and to take a look at it as we proceed uh, with our message this morning. That'll give me help, support all of those in the confirmation class, and uh, make it a little bit easier. I'd like to uh, share with you this morning some thoughts about how the Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, how the Spirit works and moves in our life. There was a man by the name of Philip. Philip was a deacon from the city of Jerusalem, from the Christian, although they weren't called Christians at that time, from the Christian congregation that was there. Philip was on his way to a road that led south to Egypt, on his road to Gaza. There was also another man by, the, by an unknown name, but he was known as a Sudanese official. A Sudanese official working in a major kingdom with a lot of authority and a lot of rules. And he had been in Jerusalem to worship. The Ethiopian was traveling in a chariot. As far as we know, Philip was traveling by his own locomotion. He was walking. One of them knew why they was going to this place besides getting to a specific des destination. One of them knew. The other one did not. One was confused. The other one perhaps was a little wondering what was going to happen, but he wasn't confused, I rest assured. Philip had been told by an angel go to this road, to this desert place that's leading to Gaza. Whether he was given more directions or not, I don't know, but whenever an angel talks to you directly, there's no problem with understanding. I need to do this. The Ethiopian that was on his way back home had been to Jerusalem, and we don't know exactly what happened in Jerusalem he went there to worship, that we know. He was, he was apparently of the Jewish faith, had gone to the temple. Perhaps he had heard about Christ. Perhaps he had heard about things that had been going on in the previous years. Perhaps he had even heard about the followers of the way. All that we know for sure is that he was riding in the chariot, reading a scroll, reading from a scroll by Isaiah. Now, the questions in front of us today is how does the Spirit work in our life? And so if we look at the guiding questions, they are these. What is the role of the Spirit in our lives? Can we see a difference in our role? Can we see a difference between the Spirit's led man's wisdom? This is quite a mouthful, but I'm going to say it. Can we see a difference between the Spirit-led people's wisdom and the spirit wisdom that creates events and dramatically alters plans. Can we see a difference and is it important that we see a difference between how the spirit moves in our lives from one where we pray asking God lead us and guide us and direct us as we did here at Word of Life as we knew that our lease would run out where we were at and so we prayed, Lord, lead us and guide us. We were people asking the Lord through the Spirit to be guided to see where we should build and how we should build. Not knowing how it was going to be, but asking the Lord and being directed. So is there a difference between that and between when suddenly something happens, which we would say is, according to human understanding, divine inter intervention. The third thing that is going to guide us as we look at the message today, as we hear it and as we read scripture and we think about it, is, is put before us 
What is, what is the difference between in our role and also the Spirit's role in being saved? What's the difference in the Spirit's role and our role in being saved or living a life in which we are saved? Okay? We're going to look at those three guide questions as we continue to look at what happened as far as Philip and as far as this royal uh, gentleman that was on his way back home and he was confused, the Ethiopian. What is the difference? Well, what does man's wisdom, led by the Spirit, look like? Let's go back to Acts 6, chapter th- uh, Acts 6, verse 3. For those of you that like to follow along, it's on page 914. So what was going on in Jerusalem at this particular time? There was an issue, and the issue was this. The twelve disciples were very busy. They could not keep up with all the things that needed to be done. There were people that were being overlooked, particularly of the, of, of the background as far as being widows with Greek background rather than Jewish background. And so the people came to the disciples and said, we need to do something about this. So the disciples came together and with prayers and godly wisdom, they said, let's do this. Let's make, let's choose people that are godly and holy, seven men that can serve us as administrators. We call them deacons in this particular case. Seven men that will serve as deacons. They'll wait on tables, They'll, they'll go in and ask people who need help. They will take food to those that need help. They will support those in our congregation so that, that, that the disciples, the twelve, can focus on preaching and the scriptures. That was by godly, by men's wisdom led by the Spirit. Godly men but led by the Spirit made that decision. The, the, the disciples said, choose seven. They were, they were chosen, and then they were blessed. They were installed. Two of them was Stephen, or Stephen, and the second one was Philip that we know something about. Now, Stephen did something which the disciples didn't know was going to happen, and what I would call direct intervention. What happened was that Stephen was given the power of the Holy Spirit and could heal and could do signs and was, it was gifted in such a way that he began preaching. And his preaching led him into trouble, and his preaching led him into his, him being stoned. Now we can say, is this in God's plan, or is this just the evil of the world reacting? And we could say both. But what we know for sure is that God used this because now, with, because of direct intervention now, the people, the people that we would refer to as Christian fled the city and went to all different places. And the word of God was spread. And one of the people that fled was, by, was the name of Philip. And Philip went to Samaria. Many of you, perhaps all of you, remember that Samaria was not a loved place for the Jews and at first not a loved place for the Christians. Samarias were of a different tribe, a different race. They had some belief in God, but their God was different. They worshipped in high places. And now Philip goes to Samaria, and Philip, by the power that God had given him through the Spirit, was able to do miracles, heal people, show signs, and teach them about the gospel. When we look at what man's wisdom led by the Spirit looks like, just review, we look at Acts 6, chapter 3. And again, we look at it, and it says, Therefore, brothers, pick up from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Now, God had plans for the seven that went past what the twelve could have imagined, and then what happened is also now shown in the scriptures as we have already talked about. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And proclaimed to them the Christ. 
then the Spirit directly intervenes in Philip's life. Not that he hadn't already, but he certainly does it next because look at what happens in verses 26 and 27. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and he went. So what are we doing? We are examining, and it's not an easy examination, but we're examining how the Spirit works in our life. Some of the times it is hard to tell, perhaps because we have become, we have become numb and just think, well, we know the Father, we know the Son, but the Spirit is there, yeah. But how does the Spirit come and directly move us, change us? Last week we had a text uh, from uh, Corinthians, uh, written by Paul, that said, do you really think that you get the Spirit by, by obeying the law? You get the Spirit by, through God's grace, through knowing that Jesus indeed is our Savior. And the Spirit, as Jesus promised his disciples and promised us, is sent for us. So how do we know how the Spirit works in our life? I think we know it by just being able to recognize, as I did last Sunday, as I said goodbye to people, as I went home, and you know, perhaps a year ago I wouldn't have thought the same, but I realized that, that, that there, was a, there were two people, I won't name them, but there were two people that I had just not got to talk to at the depth or asking the right questions that I wanted to. Yes, I had talked to other people, but there was these two that were on my mind, and it wasn't a guilt trip. I didn't feel like, oh, you know, uh, I was how terrible or how horrible. It was just that it was like a door opening up and saying, you know, the next time when you get that opportunity, as you pray to the Lord and as he leads you, say the right words, ask the right questions. Can I prove that it was the Spirit that was coming to me? Can we prove that when we are more sensitive to these things as we pray and everything opens up, that it is the Spirit that does that? Our scripture says it is indeed the Spirit that does that, and that's my proof. The Bible says so. When we built this church, there was a time where there was a small group. We had, been, had just had a service. Some of them are sitting here right in front of me. And we, uh, we went together, sort of a planning team, our very first planning team, and we sat down in toast around the table and we said, okay, what kind of church? We, we look for places that we could buy. There's nothing here. It's going to be something. We're going to have to build it. And we said at that particular time, well, what are the churches around us? And somebody said, well, they just built a new one on Fletcher. Let's go down to Fletcher and let's take a look and just walk around the property. It's after church. It's in the afternoon, early afternoon. Probably nobody be there. So we go. And so the person that's standing uh, and, and uh, uh, was seeding with the grass, was new, new grass, uh, wanted to grow new grass. The person that was seeding was, said, uh, welcomed us, said hello, and he says, oh, by the way, I'm the architect for this building. I'm a member here, and I'm an architect. I have the key. Would you like to see it? And as we talked and as we discussed, he says, oh, by the way, I love to help Christian churches in their building, and I offer my service to you at a very reduced price, as it turned out. Now, we can say, to good timing? <laughs> yeah, it was great timing. But we also can say we were praying and we were asking the Lord to lead and let us be open to that. But now let's look at the Scriptures and see how the Scriptures then support this. The angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from, Ga from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and he went. And then the spirit of the Lord, the angel first, now the spirit of the Lord, says to, said to Philip, Go to that chariot. And Philip ran to that chariot. Now whenever I hear... <laughs> Somebody running, I, I envisioned in my mind, was, was this a grace? Was Philip a grace? You know? Could he run fast? Or did he run by a, like a big, chunky offensive tackle? I don't know. <laughs> but he ran. All right, he ran, okay? 
and, and, he, and, he, and he came up to the chariot and he then asked this question, do you know what you're reading? And Philip said, how do, well, should I know what I'm reading unless somebody explains it to me? He says, get into the chariot. And so then we have our theme text. Thought it was never coming, right? Or I had forgotten it. All right. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture that was being read, he told them the good news about Jesus. Now, just think about something becoming open to you that you hadn't discovered before, something true, something real. This is what happened to this Ethiopian. And here he was reading this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And then the Ethiopian says to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth. Starting with those scriptures and then telling him about the good news. Now the next question that is guiding us is a question, what is our role in our salvation? And what is our role as far as saving in our life that is saved? Might be a little hard to pull those apart. We can use the words that we teach in confirmation class. What is our role in being justified? Justification. Or what, and what is our role in being sanctified? Sanctification. Then also the question that comes with this as far as what is the role of the Spirit? So, as far as us being justified, as far as us being saved, we have no role. But as far as we being sanctified, living in the life that the Lord wants us to be abundant for us, we have a role. Now, somebody said, it's not as easy as saying, God takes care of the justification, we take care of the sanctification. No, the Spirit works in both and somebody also said that if we want to see, compare what, what, our, what our, our, our effort is in sanctification, it's like a tiny little bird versus, you know, the most powerful force in this world, which is God. So there's a little chirping bird. That's us. So we are part of that sanctifying, or sanct- that, of, of becoming alive, becoming different because of God's power. And so when we see what we ask this question, what does it mean for us to open our mouths, beginning with Scripture, telling and living the good news about Jesus? Somebody asked me to give an example of being sanctified, sanctification. And Paul does a wonderful job when he describes uh, the different uh, ornament that we should put on and putting on a belt of righteousness. That righteousness is given to us by God. That's something that we don't earn. That is something that is there. Righteousness takes care of what our needs are. Righteousness is God's grace, God's salvation. But in Ephesians, you remember Ephesians 3, 8, and 9, you also remember 10. 8 and 9 says you, you are saved not by, not by works, but by grace alone, by through faith. And and verse 10 says, to do the good works that you have been prepared to do. To do the things that we call fruit of the Spirit. The love and the cherishing. To build the nest at home. So now, how do we open our mouths? How do we do something in life guided and led by the Spirit? Will the Spirit lead us? Certainly. Certainly. You know, there's not a whole lot of difference between the Spirit leading us in the small ways that we can observe, but, but perhaps have overlooked before. But we're looking at those, we can observe them, and the big, powerful things that there's just no way this could happen unless it was by direct intervention. It's all the Spirit. And the Spirit will guide and lead. And the nest that we build at home, the nest that the children saw in front of them, the nest that I asked them to envision. What is your nest? Who built it for you? And the right answers were Jesus, God, and the right answers were whoever loves me, whoever you love. 
And so we can say your family, and that might be nephews and nieces, that might be a family that doesn't fit parents and children, but it's a family, and it might be grandchildren and children. And it might be the grandchildren building a better nest for the parents and the, grandch- and the grandparents. So here we are. Why was Philip on that road to Gaza? He was there because the angel had told him to go. He was there because there was something that the Spirit wanted him to do. Why was the Ethiopian in his chariot mumbling to himself, <laughs> reading to himself, What does this mean? It was because the Spirit placed them both together and that intersection is also the intersection that is before you and for those that you love and for those that you will love as the future brings them to you. Grace alone, faith alone, Scripture alone. And with that, we live in God's grace. Salvation given to us, but indeed, something what we have something that is what we have to live. I thought about this as an example to use as we thank the Lord for this time to share and to be together. And it was a, it's a sample, it's, a, it's an example that comes actually uh, from the scriptures, from that time when the psalmist talks about, uh, about us, an individual the hand of God reaching down and plucking us out. And I like to think of it as, you know, as this old messy mud pile and we're in the middle of all this mud and God reaches down and brushes off the dirt and washes us clean and here we are in this life washed clean and now what's ahead of us is the enjoyable life, the difficult life, the good life, the times when it looks like, the, like we can't do the right things and yet as we trust in God, the yoke of God pulls us up. And so here, as far as being saved, we say thank you, Lord, by your grace and your grace alone we are saved. And thank you, Lord, by your grace and your grace alone we get to live a life, a full life, an abundant life. And in this we all say together, Amen.